Men are meant to be horny. That is a good sign. That is a healthy sign. I think watering down what it means to be a man has been done fairly intentionally to try and move us towards a less masculine society. And testosterone as a, as a hormone in men is falling at alarming rate of 1% per year. These are like 25 year old girls who are getting messages from guys from Love Island and stuff like that, telling them how hot they are. And you've got to compete with that shit. So for me, when you're sliding into the DMs, um, you're not replying with fire emojis or clapping hand emojis or like love heart eyes because that is just pathetic behavior. You need to be saying something that's like related to the activity that they're doing on their story or related to something they're doing in their post. And it's semi learned from you, Kezia. Escalate as soon as possible. Don't just have like a back and forth pen pal chat. And I've definitely been guilty of that as well. Like even like when I've been trying to like vet and understand, am I even interested in this girl? One of the best things you can do is just find out if you're interested by meeting them and assessing them in person. Hey guys, it's me, Kezia Noble, leading female dating and attraction expert for men. Today I have with me Colin Campbell. He's the host of the self-development podcast, Cambro Conversations. Welcome. Thanks, Kezia. Thanks for having me. Delighted to be here. Ready to rumble. You've been on mine. Now my turn to be on yours. Could you please introduce yourself to my audience for those who are not aware of you and haven't heard of you yet? Of course, Kezia. So you introduced me as the host of Cambro Conversations, and that is a self-development podcast which focuses on a huge number of different areas. It focuses on fitness, business, investing, mindset, but of course also dating when I have uh, guests like yourself on. And that all came about after a number of years of myself trying to pursue self-development, particularly within fitness and within my career. And those of you who are listening closely will hear that my accent is uh, from a little bit further north than Kezia. So I'm based in Glasgow in Scotland and I try and create content where I share the lifestyle that I live, which is balancing both my sales professional career which I do in the corporate world and pursuing peak performance when it comes to like fitness mindset relationships and investing as well so primarily I'm somebody that is always just trying to explore the best version of himself and along the way I've been sharing on Instagram built a following and then started to do the podcast where I could share things in a bit more depth as I'm sure you've found Kezi you can have much deeper more meaningful conversations on video or on podcast yeah you know I'm really missing the uh long format videos they seem to be something which is just slowly disappearing and yet so many people actually say to me they prefer my long format videos um, and and podcasts I think we're living in an age where you know TikTok and Instagram stories and shorts and things like that you know just literally such important information condensed into one minute you can argue it's by design can't your attention spans are being sabotaged yeah, but we also have to be mindful of that. You know, it is it is difficult, but look, I don't have TikTok. A lot of people say I should have TikTok, but I just can't consume information in that way. I just, I don't feel that I'm getting anything from like a one minute soundbite, essentially. So um, yeah, we're on the same page there, I think. We prefer long format interviews, podcasts, videos. I would say so. I've definitely built a much deeper connection with my audience through creating a podcast on a weekly basis than I did posting for four years prior to that on Instagram. While some people were impacted and they found benefit from content in like a, a, a short caption or, or a video on there, you can have far greater depth in a longer conversation. As, as, like that sounds obvious, doesn't it? But it doesn't appear to be the way that the platforms that we're using is going. So rebelling against that is a, is a healthy decision, I think. I agree. Let's get stuck into it. My first question that I want to ask is modern masculinity. Now, this is a real hot topic right now. How do you feel uh, that the media are portraying modern masculinity? And what do you think the real attractive masculine qualities are? You know, uh, what is the reality and what is the media trying to promote? I think for starters, there is a little bit of a, a war on masculinity. And I think it's been going on for quite some time and you and I actually touched on this a little bit in in our previous discussion so it, it, that definitely got my brain firing I think if you look at how actors are cast in movies how headlines are written in newspapers about men in general it tends to be with a slant against men that are quite traditionally masculine men so powerful strong outspoken figures are particularly in the last couple of years demonized a little bit as well and 
I think the reality is 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 in stark contrast to that, Kizzy. I think masculinity is a massively positive thing. I think men who are comfortably masculine and embrace the positive elements that that has in their life are far happier. They're far likely to suffer from this mental health crisis, which we appear to be going through. And they also tend to have much more stable relations with both other men, but also with those around them as well. And there's a there's a level of self-assurance that comes with a positive element of masculinity that reflects into all different areas of your life. So by being confident and being a strong, self-sufficient, reliable man, I think that reflects into so many different other areas rather than just uh, like the the stereotypes and the headlines that people are maybe throwing around when they think of like toxic masculinity, which is is a, is a relatively new term. Like when did that term come into being and it must have been driven by media? I think there's just toxic people. I think there's toxic women and I think there's toxic men. We don't have toxic, um, what would the other version be, toxic femininity. We, we don't hear that, okay? There are toxic people in this world. There always has been, and there always will be. But if it's a man, they say it's to toxic masculinity. And I think that's unfair. I think that's unfair because what happens is then people start thinking, oh, um, maybe I shouldn't be so outspoken. Maybe I, I, you know, I shouldn't be too confident. I shouldn't be too cocky. And it's like, no, that's not the reason why someone's saying that this guy is toxic. It's because he's a jerk. He's it's not even maybe what he says about women. It's just a way that he behaves. And because he's a man, they're just going toxic masculinity. Let's label it that. It's, it's a very, I think people are very complicated. People are complex, they're complex creatures. And we just put labels on people now. I think there's a huge fem uh, feminization of men as well, though. If you look at, and I was mentioning like characters and films, like, or even like music stars at the moment as well like there's a like men dressing more as women and that's not to say they're transitioning towards women which is obviously a, a totally different conversation but dressing very femininely like crying about like quite small matters and that's being like normalized as in that's like a positive expression of how a man should be and and while i'm not saying like men shouldn't cry or men shouldn't dress in a particular way i think watering down what it means to be a man has been done fairly intentionally to try and move us towards uh, a less masculine society. And um, it, a lot of my background is in the fitness industry, Kezia, so I, 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 I train very hard. I, a lot of my friends are, are, are into the gym as well. And testosterone as a, as a hormone in men is falling at a, an appallingly uh, like alarming rate of 1% per year in men. And testosterone is vitally important for men to function at their best, whether that's building muscle, whether that's their mood, whether that's their focus and their ability to uh, be in depth in tasks, but also for their sex drive as well. So as this is falling, that is removing some of their elements of expressions of masculinity as well. So my ability to build muscle, to concentrate, to be focused in the task, to be sexually um, up for it, that is all expressions of positive masculinity in my book. So when we're in a society and an environment where our testosterone is falling, I think despite the media's portrayal that we've got toxic masculinity, I think we have less masculine traits and less masculine activities than ever before. You're absolutely bang on the money there. Um, you know, a lot of people like, men are meant to be horny. Men are meant to be horny. That is a good sign. That is a healthy sign that they're horny. If that, you know that kind of guy where you know he's more interested in, in looking at his phone and eating probably than meeting women. He's just not that horny guy. And I always think horny is a sign that the guy is healthy. Um, Evolutionary, we would, we would need to have a level of sex drive and a level of arousal and a level of horniness, as you've called it, to continue to be a species. Whereas nowadays we sort of just drift on through life without ever needing to be like, uh, like assertive with our with, with our needs. Can I ask you something? I have a theory, but I can't back this up scientifically. It's just from my experience is that men who are quite wiry and quite slim um, tend to be more horny than overweight guys. Is there a link here? Interesting. I, I'm not sure if I've noticed that because I think you get, maybe, maybe like, maybe they're more, able, if you're like athletic and tuned into your physique, you're more likely to perhaps be sexually active because females whether they like it or not will have more attraction to the man that's muscular and well kept and looks after themselves than the guy who's who's overweight and doesn't look after himself but equally you get that image of the guy that's like i don't know 
fat, lazy, and constantly lying around masturbating. So he would be horny in some senses yeah. because he's, he's pleasuring himself, but he's not actively going out and trying to deal with real women. He's maybe dealing with his urges maybe. internally, easily through the internet. Because I only get hit on by slim men. <laughs> Never, honestly, I don't get hit on by overweight guys at all. They don't look in my direct, they don't even look at me. Which is, which is fine, you know, whatever. But I'm just saying that, and I've just noticed like when I go out with my friends and stuff like that, it's it's the slimmer guys that seem to be horny looking. That's probably a confidence thing as well, because and I, I know we'll probably talk about this in this discussion, but some of my confidence in approaching like friends, males, but also females, like in a, in a, in a dating sense, comes from being self-assured in how I look and how I feel about myself and like how I've Built myself. Just possibly that food is being a repl- is now a replacement for sex for many people because you know it, people used to eat to live. It was fuel. That was it. And I remember because I'm I'm a lot older than you, and I remember growing up in the '90s and guys were not talking about food. You know, it just was like no one talked about it. No one had this like food wasn't having a meal wasn't like a big thing. It was just you grab something and you went to the club. It just wasn't um, a big deal. And now I'm finding that. A lot of guys um, seem to be talking about food more, calling themselves foodies and sort of like over enjoying food a little bit. And I was just wondering, is it possible that that's become a replacement? It definitely could be, couldn't it? Because the, maybe the dopamine or the, 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 the releasing positive hormones that they're getting from eating like particularly tasty food or like, Bad like really well presented <laughs> foods yeah it's it, it, it it's doing it's doing something for them like chemically that's maybe making up for the fact that short fallings in other areas like as maybe that, that short falling is being able to approach and be successful with women so they're they're kind of um why well, interestingly one of the reasons that i know about you kezi is you appeared on modern wisdom with chris williamson and chris talks about people retreat to the inner citadel so by retreating from the battlefield to the citadel you withdraw yourself from the battlefield so the opportunity to lose or be hurt so these guys perhaps are withdrawing themselves from the opportunity to face rejection or not be successful by just withdrawing from the dating game or the the approaching women game altogether and just instead they're in this comfortable safe space which is i am going to have these hyper palatable tasty foods and talk about how i'm like so cultured when it comes to going to these particular restaurants so they've replaced one important activity with something that's a lot easier for them and less chance of them like hurting their feelings probably quite a few things i reckon so i've actually written out a list here and it's eight qualities that i believe an attractive masculine man possesses and i would love to get your take on them so number one, okay, it's pretty obvious, confidence in himself and what he says, it's obvious. Two, consistency, okay. Three, the ability to champion a woman and protect a woman. This is huge. Four, being unapologetic for who he is and what he believes in. Five, someone who doesn't carry bitterness, past experiences with women in particular. Now, there's a lot of guys right now, and we can talk about this later, who are on YouTube, with fairly big followings, who are holding a lot of pain for past experiences. And they're humiliating women on their shows. They are, you know, obsessed with how hideous older women are. You know, they've got the absolute obsession of any woman who's over 22 has expired, their words. And I just think, my God, this is coming from such a negative place. And I think a lot of this guys who are toxic, I'm not saying it's toxic masculinity, by the way, I'm just saying they're toxic. They've got a lot of bitterness and anger and you can feel it and you can feel that these are guys who've been rejected and rejected and rejected. And now they've got a shiny Instagram account, they've got a small following on YouTube and they can get a certain level of woman, but they're still carrying that bitterness. We've all had bad experiences. I know I've had my fair share, I'm sure you have, but it's about learning from those experiences and taking a more positive, approach you know and becoming better rather than holding on to that pain so that was number five six self-belief and belief in his personal trajectory seven a positive outlook he doesn't catastrophize a real man for me does not catastrophize he has or finds solutions that's a big thing i saw in the pandemic a lot of grown men panicking and catastrophizing 
And I can tell you now, I, it was really people I knew that I used to respect turn into babies, essentially, frightened children. That was very telling. Um, you, could see, you could see how many men were, who could step up, and it was not many. And eight has no need for external validation. So I'd love to get your, you know, what you feel about those. You can challenge them for democracy. I think I, I think I strongly agree with almost all of them. But one of the ones that you went into more depth on was number five around bitterness. And I think that for me shows a very immature man who maybe resents previous experiences with women that have maybe hurt him or burnt him. And for that to continue to shape his outlook on how women are is completely wrong. Because as you said, you're not necessarily exposed to toxic masculinity or toxic femininity. You're probably just exposed to like a bad actor or a, a, a disingenuous person. And yes, that's going to cause you pain and hurt. And you can probably learn the lessons, but you don't need to go on and on about it in terms of in for the rest of your life and resenting that. And like one of my big things is if, if I'm if I'm dating somebody new, I'm not going to be dragging up all the things I didn't like about my ex because that's not necessary. But you see that a lot in conversations, like people harking back to previous experiences and almost uh, using that as a stick to beat their new partner with as well. And you're thinking, why would you continue to bring up previous experiences with somebody new? Obviously, I think from an evolution perspective, it's like they're trying to protect themselves and warn this new partner, if you behave like that, that will be a no-go for me, which I guess there's some benefit to setting boundaries, but the bitterness and resentment that people hold for people in their past, there's a lot to be said as a man for just letting things go and moving on and just doing your absolute best for yourself rather than trying to maybe do things out of spite or to hurt somebody else moving forward. Well, yeah. Very good points, but you know you're going to be speaking about red flags that you look for in a woman. I can tell you a red flag is a bitter man. I'm meeting a guy, if he's bitter about his past, he hasn't resolved it in some way, that's a big red flag. That is, call it like a wounded animal, and wounded animals can switch and turn very quickly. Yeah, su such a good point. Um, one of the other things that was immediately standing out to me was around the, the positive outlook and the catastrophizing, because as you said, in the last couple of years, you've certainly seen people fold under pressure or under a narrative and behave in a way that's completely unbecoming of somebody that should be like a self-assured masculine person and for me like you say when when stress and difficult experiences come to the table whether that's a government enforced lockdown and and, and, a, and, a, and a, lot, a lot of pressure and scare stories or whether that's like in your day job you're made redundant or your business starts to fail when you have challenges being able to stand up to those challenges and set an example, not only for yourself, but for those around you is an extremely positive masculine trait. And that for me is where you see a lot of leaders actually come into their own and perform at their best. When the pressure and the challenge comes on, you need to stand up to that and demonstrate your, your qualities, your confidence, but also your capabilities. And people gravitate towards strong leaders during these challenging periods whether that's on a on a micro scale like within a business or a company or whether that's on a macro scale within a government and a, and, a, and, a, and a nation but we definitely lack that during this period and i think if you looked at the levels of masculinity and the positive traits that we saw from leaders there was very few that you could maybe point towards that you would say that is a a masculine well well put together stable reliable person that we can follow like certainly we didn't have that in the uk with with johnson at all um, by the way, did you notice that um, out of those eight qualities, I didn't mention once anything to do with being successful, having a successful career or being financially successful? Because you can be a strong man and possess attractive masculine qualities and be serving coffee in Starbucks. This is what people, a lot of people don't get. They think, oh, I need to have the, the Lamborghini and I need to have this and that's gonna make me look like a strong alpha male. And, you know, I've seen this, I've seen guys who are happy with who they are and they, they have a shit job, just, you know, in terms of like, they're not making a lot of money. And they say, I, I'm not particularly ambitious. I like my life to be like this. I like it to be at a slow pace. That's fine, they own it. They're not trying to impress or prove that they're something that society says they have to be. And, you know, I think a lot of women, they go for successful men because it's, let's put away the gold diggers here okay put them to one side who are just looking for a certain lifestyle um success the reason why they go for successful men is because success is indicative of determination and confidence
But I have dated very successful guys, extremely successful guys. And in actual fact, it was just discipline and hard work that got them there. And although discipline and hard work are things that, yeah, of course, you know, you applaud those things. They're great. They're very important. They're not exactly attractive. They're just something that you respect. So I think what happens is you see a successful guy, and you think, okay, it's a shortcut. I'm going to presume that this person is confident and all the rest of them has like great energy. But actual fact, a lot of them are just hardworking and disciplined. And that's how they got there. And they're completely shit with women, completely nervous, have absolute, have very little self-belief. Quite often it's, it's levels of confidence within a particular domain though. So I suspect these gentlemen that you're talking to, talking about are maybe very confident within the one area that they've been successful in. But by not having success across multiple different areas or not applying their hard work and discipline to working on the other areas of their life, like maybe social skills or their physical appearance or some of their qualities around like their self-belief in other domains, they maybe have like indexed too narrowly and ended up in a position where, yes, you've got this massive business success and career success, but of course it's not going to be attractive if you're not capable or like self-assured in, in, in so many other different domains of life. I mean, look, most of our students are people who are extremely successful in their career. They, you know, they, they, they're really successful in many areas, in fact, of their life, but just they're struggling with women. It hasn't, people think, oh, if I'm confident in this area, I can just sort of transfer that into this area. No, you do need skills. At some, you know, you need to know what to do and have that experience, especially if you've not had experience with being good at women. So you have no positive reference points and you're really starting from ground zero. Undoubtedly. So I have another question. I'm really interested in this. What are men looking for in a female? Oh, I'll get I'll get my list out for you, Kezia. There's um for me, I think as an underlying start point, you need to be physically attracted to the the woman. I think from an evolutionary perspective, to have that urge and that sexual um excitement that you spoke about earlier when it comes to horniness, you need to have that with the woman that you're interested in. And that's certainly the case for me. Like I've dated girls before who have like I've liked a lot of their personality traits and I've almost tried to trick myself into thinking that I like them beyond that. But if sexually they don't keep me excited, then that's when I'm going to be more prone to not keep up my level of interest in them. Be beyond that, I think personality traits wise, I think you're looking for stability, reliability, calmness, um, similar to what we said when it came to the, the masculine um, traits, like being like able to deal with a little bit of pressure. Now that's not to say that they need to be as self-sufficient as the man or myself, but not being like irrational or really, really volatile. I find that's something um, that's important. Not seeking validation way, online. True. Just to go back to your valid, uh, go before your validation point, I think men are absolutely terrified of crazy women. Yeah. And rightly so. Crazy cuckoo women. They are, yeah, they don't like it. Whereas women can sort of romanticize a little bit. Like he's crazy. But <laughs> but um, no, men don't like unhinged women. I think there's nothing more frightening than an unhinged woman. Well, there's very little that you can do about that because from a physical perspective, as a man, you shouldn't be putting your hands on a woman. So if a woman becomes completely unhinged from a physical sense, that's extremely alarming. And also women yeah. will use their tongues and their words a lot stronger than men can. I, I can tell you that for free. Not just that, you cannot leave. If you have children as women, that's frightening. You cannot have an hysterical mother. That's a huge point. I think okay. like levels of neuroticism are something that I would always look for in a personality. So if somebody swings quite violently in terms of their mood that for me is a is, is a is a massive no-go so i would always look for somebody who's a lot more stable a lot more calm i like um a, ambitious women and that's not to say that they are only career driven but that they have some level of aspiration for how they spend their time like um you were saying about the the masculine man who might have a lot of really good qualities who works in a coffee shop now as long as they like working in that coffee shop that's yeah. fine but if somebody to me is like moaning about their circumstances or saying like oh Colin like I hate I hate my job I want to quit I want to marry a rich man that for me is just like a no-go I'm like you're you're a very low level uh human being let alone like potential partner like you're just not somebody that I would want to spend a lot of time with because I'm somebody that's wanting to pursue my best and, and move forward and I guess that links into having somebody that's got a growth mindset as well because I have been in uh, dating situations before where 
by pursuing personal excellence and growth myself, you can make somebody deeply uncomfortable with the fact that you're going to the gym again, you're, uh, you're recording a podcast, you've got an online following, and that's not somebody that's seeking validation from online following, but sharing content on there. That can make somebody deeply uncomfortable if you're trying to pursue something that is a little bit outside the, the, the scope of normal. When, should, when do you believe uh, a man should have sex with a woman? This is such an interesting question to answer because a lot of people will have very different like moral boundaries, but also society has put on a lot of different expectations in recent years. We've had like, what are we on, third, fourth wave feminism, which almost entitles women to just sleep around at will and, and do whatever they want to do. Now, there's positives in that perspective because women were previously oppressed to some extent, but it's almost gone too far where from a chemical perspective, women sleeping around is extremely unhealthy because they will build connection with men who are never going to give them that back. And that links to what some of the rules that I have in place as well. Like, now don't get me wrong, I've obviously made made made, made mistakes with this and uh, I've kind of refined the r- approach in, in, in recent years. But men, one night stands are fine as long as you're not doing it under the under the guise of like misleading the the person that you're sleeping with. I think that's an extremely unhealthy position to be in. Like I'm a big fan of Jordan Peterson and one of his uh, rules for life is try and tell the truth, but if not, do not lie. So lying to women in order to increase the number of women that you've slept with and trick somebody into bed is like quite an unhealthy thing. You see a lot of guys like almost give like fake commitment in order to get what they want. And I think that's extremely unhealthy. If, for example, I sleep with a woman after the first date, I will. it's very unlikely that I will date that woman a second time because if she's giving sex to me on the very first date, it's not just because I'm special and of a higher value than ever before. It's because she perhaps does that with far more men than that. And that, for me, is quite an unattractive thing. And that might be... Promiscuous women. No. I don't, I, I, like... I think um, women continue to be the sexual gatekeepers and men continue to be, despite the lower levels of sex drive, the sexual protagonists. And women hold the keys to that interaction happening. And to use a very crude analogy, if you are a a key that opens lots of locks, yes, you are a master key to some extent, but if you're a lock that opens to an awful lot of keys, then you're a pretty poor lock. So you need to have some level of like values and discipline that are in line with mine in order for me to see a longer term future with you um, from, from that perspective, I, I don't think a woman that has a, a really high body count would be something that I would be comfortable dating with in the future. And I think the statistics do bear that uh, both men and women with extremely high body counts are more likely to get divorced because they don't get the same level of satisfaction from being monogamous for the rest of their life. And that for me would be something that I would be worried about. I believe that a man should sleep with a woman is try at least and sleep with a woman as soon as possible. That's what I teach my students. You know, if yep. you kissed her by the third date, forget it. It's not like it's impossible. I have ways that can, you can sexually escalate and build attraction even on the third date. Nothing's happened, but you've just made it so much harder for yourself. You've got to be kissing on the first date. You've got to go in for that kiss the first date. Um, yes, okay, let's put aside some cult, different cultures. I understand they have certain rules around dating and stuff. I'm just talking about Western culture here, UK, America. Um, yeah, you've got to go into that kiss straight away. And I think the man should try and sleep with the woman as soon as possible. But I do understand there is a conflict there, which is, you know, it might be good for him, but then he's not. He's going to be less interested in after. Yeah, if it comes too easily, Kezia, then... Of course, of course. Of course. Exactly that. And for, 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 for me, yes, the man should want to have sex as soon as possible. That's like a healthy dynamic. That's that physical attraction piece. That's that personalities match to some extent where you're stimulated by it. But if, um, if you put in minimal effort and you get the maximum return, which is probably for most men, yeah. uh, consensual sex, then <laughs> it, 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 it's come too easily. So the value of it is immediately lowered. Like if I think, for example, that if I have sex with the first time I meet her, how many other men are achieving that quite easily without, and you doesn't can tell yourself a story. It doesn't make you feel special. Yeah. And that, that's, that's quite, that's quite, that's maybe quite a, quite a funny term, isn't it? Like a lot of women would want to feel special, but the man also wants to feel like some several of level of like effort. My effort has been rewarded by the, 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 the ultimate reward. I put an effort. I've, 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 I had good game. I had good approach. I spoke well, I built a connection and then it happened. But if it just happens off the bat without any effort at all, then it lowers the value of it entirely. Of course, of course. 
So what other red flags do you feel men should be looking out for when they're meeting women? I think the big one I mentioned was that volatility piece. So like the ability for them to act in a really kind of crazy unsettling way. And that's, that's not a very large number of women, but there's enough out there that uh, it's, it's something to look out for. Other red flags for me, like constantly seeking validation online with either like really provocative photos or just um, like, like quite outlandish behavior, like on their Instagram stories or something like that, like almost crying out for attention from a, from a male perspective. And that for me comes from like, perhaps being unhappy in like who they truly are and like trying to validate how they feel um, by like getting lots of likes or lots of engagement. Can we talk about that for a second? Because, could, oh, sorry, could you share your age with my audience, please? I, I'm 29, I'm, I'm 30 in October. Okay, so we are a different, you know, million miles apart, but we're a fair generation apart. <laughs> um, and, you know, people dating before social media, they had a situation where, you know, my girlfriend or the girl I'm dating wears very provocative clothing and she obviously wants attention from, from people around her. Even when we go out for dinner, she's wearing low cut tops. But at some point you kind of think, well, she's doing it for me also maybe. And maybe the, you don't, you don't quite know, but with social media, you know, it's not for you. It is that differs. People. That's a huge difference. Well, there you go. And also this is from a female perspective is that it's addictive. These likes are addictive, okay? Um, you know, you can just put a, an average looking girl now, just puts on filters, puts on something sexy, gets in a certain position, and she's got all these guys telling her how hot she is. And she has got, if I'm getting, I'm getting a lot of messages from famous guys, you know, their blue ticks and all the rest of it on my Instagram. And I'm barely on there. I am hardly on there. And my images are like, yeah, they're quite sexy, but not like some girls. So I can't imagine what they're getting. And, you know, these are like 25 year old girls who are getting, you know, messages from guys from Love Island and stuff like that, telling them how hot they are. And you've got to compete with that shit. And this is why actually I found a lot of men who started dating older women, but even older women are doing shit like this. I'm not going to lie, even older women, but it's not as addictive as, as young women. But a lot of the guys that I date younger men on the whole, and I've, you know, I speak to them like, why do you go for older women? They're like, because they're not always looking at their phones. They're not looking for validation. So they're not obsessed with Instagram and social media in the same way. It's a huge turnoff. It really is. And if somebody is a bit more in control of their attention, like you say, not always looking at their phone, they're more in the present moment. That's extremely attractive than the girl that's maybe like, like wanting to take content and, and, and share that they're at the latest venue or um, share they've got the latest outfit. It's problem and it's getting worse because now you've got, it's not just, remember the old days, when I say the old days, but about like 10 years ago, you say, can you just take one nice picture of me, babes? And it's like, okay, I'll take a nice picture, done. But now it's like, no, I need a video. I need a short, I need a, I need a music video. I need to do a dance routine at the bloody restaurant. And you're like, it used to be just a photograph. It used to be maybe 10 photographs. Let's find the right one. Okay, now shut up and eat your food. <laughs> but now it's like... You're so right. There's the whole um, like hashtag boyfriends of Instagram and they joke when they go away on holiday. Like it's just, they've just started, like, they're basically away with their photographer because it's just constantly photo shoot after photo shoot. And like you say, like I, I'm somebody that creates a lot of content for my Instagram. If I'm out with somebody, they'll maybe be like one photo like of the meal or of, of whatever we're up to. And that'll be that because you want to be present in the moment and being present and able to hold a great conversation and hold somebody's focus and excite somebody with your words and like get, get really engaged. That's attractive. That's what genuinely like makes you feel great when you're with somebody, not the fact that, oh yeah, we got, we got this amazing uh, reel or Instagram post that got thousands of likes that should do nothing for you. And if you're just being strung along, creating content for the person you're with, that's extremely unattractive. It's getting worse. These are not women yeah. who are doing it because like you and I, we have, you know, we have a business, we have a brand. They're doing it for likes. You know, it's, it's mental. It is, it has become a mental disorder because then let's say they take the picture, they've taken the picture. Okay. We're good. Their mind is not on you. They're thinking how many likes, what are people saying? And at the moment, maybe they'll be polite with you and not look at their phone. That's okay, fine, props to that. You go to the bathroom, that phone's out. They're checking the likes, they're checking the comments. So what happens is when you upload a picture, 
or a video, your mind, even though you're not looking at that phone, your mind is on that and you're sort of distracted. You're thinking about other things. You're not 100% present with that other person. And a lot of people say to me, well, you know, why don't you put up more on social media? I said, I love my life. I love enjoying my life. I put up social media. I put up what I'm doing. I put up some sexy pictures, fine. But I want to love my life. I want to enjoy it. I don't want to be that person, you know, 70 years old, trying to remember my life and just, you know, having flashbacks of me looking at a screen. I actually had this thought, but you know, they say when you die, you have these flashbacks. And yours, yours is going to be like this. <laughs> How many likes did I get? What did Awful. that person say? Oh my God, that sounds really frightening, actually. It sounds hellish, doesn't it? And yeah, I, I think it's a massive challenge finding somebody that isn't um, completely consumed by it. Um, young women, especially young. Yeah, and like you say, young women are like particularly even like ones that are maybe like five, six, seven years younger than me. They would have grown up with the smartphone far more part of their their life. Like I was seventeen when I had my first smartphone. It was a BlackBerry. I was last year at school. You only used like BBM as messenger, and then you would you would have to be at home on the Wi-Fi or the broadband to actually access like Facebook or whatever else you were using at that point. Maybe Bebo, I don't know. And <laughs> nowadays, you, remember Face Party it was like. <laughs> it's but it, but it, but it's wild now Kezia because the amount of screen time that they have and the socialization with it it's very difficult to see how somebody can be like present in the moment with somebody else like and I, I have a very strict like no phones at the table rule when I'm out with somebody because yeah you can take a photo of the meal if you want to but you're not posting it right now we don't need to worry about that right now like do that when you get home like it's not it's not post. important yeah don't post till you get home that should be the new rule no, don't post when you're with me because you'll be still distracted post when you go home and you're done um i had um on my show zuby do you know who zuby is yeah zuby's on my show as well really good guy yeah and he i love like he wrote something on twitter this is how i actually got to know him is like he wrote he put a tweet out saying like everything was perfect at 2005 2005 was like peak and I've always said, it's a weird thing I've always had with my friends going, 2005 was like, that, that was the point when things were at their best. Like you had the internet, you had, the, you had some social media, you had Facebook and MySpace, but you had to, as you said, you had to log in, you had to sit in a laptop, you had to, you know, you had to log in. And remember how people used to do photo dumps and they used to just put all their photographs. They didn't even think about it, just put all their photographs of their holiday. And some of them would be cheesy and some would be, they'd look beautiful. And some of them, it would be so funny. And we all used to enjoy it. I used to love it when people put up their photographs because it was funny and we could all have a laugh. And now it's like people go on holiday and they put up one photograph, just one beautiful one with a caption you know, underneath. And it's like, this is not- Perfectly curated content designed for maximum engagement and the maximum feeling of reward from you posting it and the maximum amount of attention if that's the way that that person is aligned. So I think that's a huge point. And Zuby's absolutely right. Like one of the big things he said to me on my show was he hasn't become an extremist. He's just stayed where he has in terms of his views on freedom and values. And society has just gone mad, making him look like this pariah, or at least not, not a pariah, but he looks like he stands out because he's actually stood still and maintained a level of traditional values that we, well, people like you and I are maybe more aligned with, but society as a whole has moved away from. And they're like, oh my God, he's this extremist in terms of how like, strong his views are. Actually, if he, in 2005, you probably thought he's pretty middle of the road. So give us one last red flag that you look out for when dating women. I think one other red flag that stands out is just a lack of like self-respect and care for yourself. So somebody who just doesn't look after themselves. So people that particularly as they approach my age, 29, 30, who are still continually going out and partying and seeking like short-term fun in terms of just always experience led. Now that's not to say that you shouldn't be sporadic and have fun and enjoy yourself. But if you're constantly just like, chasing highs and maybe like going on holiday every other week or doing city breaks every other week or going on nights out like two or three nights a week and not focused at all on like normal life. I think they're probably running away from something. And that for me points to that whole instability thing, which I just don't like deal particularly well with. And I don't think a lot of men are particularly interested in if somebody is somebody who can't like be happy and like where they are, but equally I think if you have a lack of self-care for yourself, it means maybe you're not training, you're not looking after yourself. And a lot of people can get away with that in terms of how they look and how they feel up to the age of about 29, 30. And then things start to go south. Like 
in the in the least like targeted way possible i look at people that i maybe knew from school and university and they're unrecognizable in terms of how unhealthy they look now because their lifestyles caught up with them because they haven't looked after themselves they haven't maintained uh any form of like personal like self-care routine that's allowed them to look in a healthy young way like a lot of people remark that my skin's really young and I, I, i'm quite boyish looked but that's because i live like a pretty healthy lifestyle and i look after myself so somebody that i'm with it's a red flag if they don't have any like form of like self-care for themselves so like they don't need to be as into the gym as i am or as into my nutrition as i am but some form of like focus on how they look and how they feel for the longer term is important because say you get with them at 26 you might be getting them at their peak in terms of how well they've looked after themselves and you were talking about there's certain men out there that are talking about women hitting their expiry date i think that's completely disingenuous and completely unfair but some women do hit their expiry date because their bad habits and their awful lifestyle catches up with them and they and by the age of 32 you wouldn't look at them twice in the street because they've just declined i had a funny th- I, I i had a weird thing but i look better at 32 than 22 but I don't, I think I put that down to some weird genetics. <laughs> I just really do. I mean, I really looked better at 32 than 22. So I peaked later than most women. So yep. that's good for me because, you know, now I'm just integrating. It's fine. But I had like, I had a good run. That's what I'm saying. And I, th- I think that, I think that's very important though. Like somebody doesn't just like fall off a cliff in terms of how they look. It's, it's because of like, a, a, like their, activities their habits and their behaviors up until that point and if somebody that i'm with doesn't look after themselves in any way then i think that's a red flag for like the longevity of the relationship as well this leads me perfectly to my next question we're going to talk a little bit about training and looking after yourself but doing it not just to attract other people this is something that you believe in can you of course it is kezia I, I started lifting weights through rugby when I was like 14, 15. I was in like the kind of development pathways for my age group in, in, in Scotland. Now, I wasn't a fantastic rugby player, but they looked at me as somebody that was needed to bulk up in order to be competitive as he got older. And that was certainly the case. But as a young guy, when you start lifting weights, the first thing you notice is that you're getting like slightly bigger arms. So people in school are like, oh, like, do you go to the gym and stuff like that? And that feels great. So you start to attract people and you can do it from like a selfish perspective and a very shallow perspective at that point but there needs to come a point where that tips over into being for yourself as well and having like self-assurance so one of the big things for me is you can have like a huge amount of control over how you look because you control the inputs that go into that so that's your training and your nutrition your sleep your recovery all these things that you can manage and have control over dictate the outcome and how the how you look going forward so for me that gives you like a tremendous amount of empowerment and it often overlaps into other areas as well now i know you're saying there about discipline and hard work doesn't always uh, uh, mean success with women and i would certainly agree with that but it does mean you can put that into other areas of your life and it gives you a positive feedback loop that yes i've got control over these other areas and i feel fantastic i look fantastic that's going to overlap into so yeah, many so different areas beyond that what i meant by that is they're not direct kind of things that attract women um a woman would say oh i you know i had to fuck his brains out because he's so disciplined it, it's not that it, it, but discipline of course, i always teach my students to be disciplined and to be hard working and focused but i can tell you now as a woman women do not fuck men because they're hard working and disciplined they admire it they think that's a great quality it's a bit like let me put it this way um men admire a successful businesswoman they admire it they respect it it adds to the conversation but they're not attracted to it not like how a woman is attracted to a man who has success for the reasons i said before not because of success but because of what it is indicative the traits that's the traits huge that with it yeah whereas i have never had a man say you know i really fancied you kezia because of how much you've achieved i've never had it they, they'll say it's some, I won't, I won't go into it, but it'll be things that I'll be like, it'll be feminine things about me. It'll be my vulnerable side. It'll be like how I am with my child. In fact, they see that and they find that very attractive. The way I hold myself, the way I laugh, um, things like that. They find that that's what makes them attracted to me. But my success, everything I've worked for, no, no they said not made any difference at all it's it's admirable but it's not attractive that's a very important distinction like you say and i, I would say i am it was a shock I, for me by the way that was a shock for me and i learned that very young i was like i look you know i go first class and i do this and i got all my own money and i've got a stable of men working for me i mean come on and just like 
yeah, it's cool, but it doesn't make you more attractive. I do think there's elements of attractiveness to women that are self-sufficient that don't need you, but allow you to help them as well. So I think one of the qualities you named it, the eight masculine qualities was the man being able to like support and be reliable. Sometimes it's nice when a woman isn't like crying out for that and doesn't necessarily need it. So Kezia, like you do not need a man to come in and like pay your bills and look after you or buy you dinner, but you allowing the man to buy him dinner, buy you dinner because you've enjoyed the experience. No, they must buy me dinner. So I have yeah. this rule and I say it to guys, listen, it's not about, I'm not a gold, I have money, okay? That's not the problem. But I am a woman, you are a man, and it would put me off if you made me pay for half the mill. It would put me off you. So I can pay for half the mill, we can do that, and I won't see you again, just because I'll be physically turned off by you. I will be, I cannot, you know, I don't care how old you are. I don't care if you're an 18 year old guy, whatever. This is what you have to do as a man. It's chivalry, isn't it? And yes. that's that's tra- that's traditional. So, like the same as like holding the door open or going getting the chair for the yes. for, for for the woman, really or even like opening. She wants to sit first, it, guys. Okay, listening out there, this is really important. This is not about me trying to get a free meal or free drinks. God no, it's really not. It's about the fact that I want to be on a date and feel like the woman, and this is the man. And I've said, the, even the most, and I'm an independent, strong woman. All this. Every, nearly, okay, I'm not going to say every single woman. There's some women who are going to put their, their politics and their ideology before anything else. But most women, are they find it just instinctually attractive. when a guy- It's inbuilt, Katia. It's evolutionary. It's, it's, our, it's in our programming that the man should be a stable, supportive provider to some extent, but it shouldn't be necessary. Even though I like young guys and I've been out 22, 21 years old, I still expect it. I'm like, no, I'm sorry. You know, and they actually, they love paying for the older woman. I've noticed that they get a bit of a funny kick out of it. Okay, there we go. That's brilliant. Um, But but one of the reasons that I think training is so important from like, uh, or looking after your self-perspective and how it links to like what you do, Kezi, in terms of helping men attract women and, and, and be successful. Jordan Peterson has an idea where men often ask, or oh, how do I find my ideal partner? And ultimately he says that people asking that question quite often don't have their own house in order. They haven't made their own bed, which is one of the things he talks about. Now that for me is if you have like an ideal partner that you would like to get with, you should try and be like how they would expect an ideal partner for them to be. So that might be you're well kept, you have a, a positive exercise habit, you eat good food, so you're well you're like well maintained, you have a, a good career, a successful job, or at least you're passionate or like happy with the work that you do. So by you holding yourself to high standard and being like on point from with regards to like the things that you should be doing, you can attract a higher quality of mate from that regard rather than like maybe bemoaning the quality of the market or, Oh, I can't find the right woman for me. It's probably partly your fault as well. Like how often, like, like if you cannot get a, a woman for, for, for love nor money and you, you, like you, you, you never get success with asking women on dates, there's probably something that you're doing that you are doing wrong. So you probably need to look after yourself a bit more and make yourself of a higher value in terms of like who you are to yourself as well as who you are to these people too. Colin, where do you meet women? A lot online through my Instagram, um, but also in, in gyms or through friends. And um, now that's not to say that I necessarily approach women in gyms, but if they're like friends with people that I know and I introduce them, that's quite a common way that happens equally like i have used tinder in the past but i'm i'm not a fan of that app particularly after our conversation you were you were you were scathing about the the dating apps to some extent which i would which i would i would typically agree with i don't think they're particularly viable but um a mixture of instagram but also like in person or like even like referrals through friends in terms of like oh we're going out to this venue you should come like such and such is coming as well and you meet people that way and quite often your values are more likely to be aligned if you have shared mutual friends as well and um i'm sure my uh, audience and my listeners would like to know how what do you say to girls on instagram how do you say what do i say on instagram yeah um you're not replying with fire emojis or clapping hand emojis or like love heart eyes because that is just pathetic behavior and they're also getting that from oh you were saying there in terms of like number and volume of inquiry like like this sounds, <laughs> this sounds funny, but because of my Instagram page, I, obviously I will get some level of inbound inquiry, but females don't typically message first. That's just a fact. It takes a particular type of female to do that. And um, maybe the type of female that would want to pay, pay for, pay for dinner actually. And, um, 
So for me, when you're sliding into the DMs, you need to be saying something that's like related to the activity that they're doing on their story or related to something they're doing in their post. Equally, as soon as possible, send some sort of voice note or something that's different because how many guys are confident enough to send a voice note? How many guys are confident enough to say something that's a little bit different? And equally, again, something I sort of semi learned from you, Kezia, escalate as soon as possible. Don't just have like a back and forth pen pal chat. And I've definitely been guilty of that as well. Like even like when I've been trying to like vet and understand, am I even interested in this girl? One of the best things you can do is just find out if you're interested by meeting them and assessing them in person. Do they look like their photos? Are they actually interested in some of the things that you're interested in? Can you can they hold a conversation or are they going to be just sat on their phone the whole time hoping that you'll take a photo that will get them lots of likes so they can get more invited to more dates? It's a, it, 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 it's a funny thing. So for me on Instagram, I would be saying like, reply something like related to what they've been up to in their story or their, or their, or their, or their post and be confident and immediately as much as possible send some sort of voice note to differentiate yourself to show your confidence but also like escalate and ask them to do something quite quickly because we can all get into like pen pal relationships which are no fun for anyone involved how many followers do you have on instagram about fifteen thousand. do you feel though that that helps you get the attention they they check and they go oh hold on a second he's got 15 000. it's valid oh, it's validation of social status to some extent yes it is that's completely correct um it's social proof that you're somebody of relative value and status. But I think that's quite sad. And, it, you know, like, I, I hate that because, um, like, you know, good for you. But there's a lot of my students who have barely any followers on Instagram or no Instagram at all. But for instance, like on Twitter, I've got a blue tick, Facebook, blue tick, YouTube. And when I put something on Twitter, it's like it often goes viral. And I, I can put I can message any fa- not any famous person, but I can message famous people and they'll get back to me like that they will reply to me. And I know other people are trying to speak to them and they won't get the reply. The blue status, helps. Sta- status helps. Status in, helps. In the same way you were saying about successful men who have a successful business, it's a sign of some sort of positive stri- traits. It's not so important. Yeah, there was, there was something I saw on, on, on Twitter, actually. Rob Henderson, who I think would be a really interesting interview for, for both of our podcasts, actually. He speaks about evolutionary psychology and the dynamics between men and women. And there was a study where men were shown a photo of an an attractive woman dressed in like a Burger King outfit. And they were shown a a photo of an attractive woman in in, in like a business suit. Women were shown a photo of an attractive man in a Burger King outfit and a kind of geeky man in the suit. Now, the men pretty much didn't really care and differentiate between the women in the Burger King outfit or um, or the suit, because as you said, success isn't a massive thing for them. But far more women chose the man in the suit who looked a little bit nerdy than the attractive guy in the Burger King uniform because for them status was important it mattered because it was a it was a it was a sign either of financial security for the longer term and support or at least some sort of quality that they would find attractive beyond just the aesthetics and the look so it's definitely a a factor when it comes to uh, comes to these things status is a uh, is king it is interesting how women are looking out more for that blue tick how popular is this guy what do other people think of him? That's a big one. What do, how do other women view him? Does he get women? Whereas the men are looking at the woman going, is she hot? She's That's the filter. Followers. She's got, okay, if she's got a blue tick, it's a bit more intriguing. Obviously, it's like, who is this? Oh, it's someone quite well known. But ultimately, is she hot? Yeah, that's the, that's the big thing. But uh, equally, I've, I've got friends that use Instagram mostly to, to speak to women and, and go on dates and they don't have big profiles. They just have like well-presented photos of themselves. They look like they're living a cool lifestyle, but they maybe don't have thousands of followers, but they just have like a well-curated profile in terms of photos with friends doing cool activities. They have like a, a clear headshot of themselves so you can see what they look like, uh-huh. but it, but they maybe aren't necessarily flexing big time, but they show that they're living like a, like a relatively cool, successful lifestyle, that they're well, they're well put together. They're not like some dweeb that hides behind like an anonymous profile. Yeah, I teach my students how to... Uh, get into the dms and how to use instagram it's just essentially another dating app although i do still prefer them to not use dating apps at all i do find that using social media is slightly better <laughs> it's more it's better because it's more in depth isn't it whereas this, the dating apps are very limited it's just something needy about being on a dating app it's my generation it's just something about it says i'm lonely i'm looking it's like mm, okay but yeah. when you know if someone's going and doing it via you know dming on on instagram it's more like oh it's random it's like oh cute girl might as well go for it like you've seen her in the in, in a street or something 
So, okay, my last question is, what is going on in the men's, you know, self-help development community? It's like a soap opera. It's like a constant drama of YouTubers arguing with each other and people making reaction videos of people arguing with each other. Have you noticed this without saying any names? Have you noticed like there's, it's, it's really getting like quite comical, unfortunately. It's a very popular uh, way to create content, a reaction video. And I think it's actually quite a cheap way to create and get likes because if, for example, I ever chose to do that kind of content, which I don't, you can pick somebody who has a massive audience, use their name, use a section of their video, and then react to it and almost ride their coattails to get the engagement. Okay. Especially, yeah, especially if you say something that's like particularly controversial. So if you really bad mouth somebody who's got a massive following and critique them, you're creating like this internet drama and beef. And we know that the way the, app, the apps and the platforms are set up, they reward you being able to keep people on the platform. So if I do a reaction video to somebody's content and I say something really controversial and it's like a three minute video and throughout the three minutes, I'm just firing insults and saying really disparaging things. Yeah, slaughtering people are going to stay on there and watch the whole thing. Whereas if I give like a 30 minute detailed explanation of why I think their point's not quite correct and I try and critique it, people lose interest, they'll drop off, they'll go and watch the next thing that's sensationalized because we were speaking before the attention span of people is is just so rotten. But I think it's a very immature, short-term way to try and grow a following and do that kind of thing. And I think while you can rightly call out people on the internet who are maybe doing things that you don't agree with, A lot of people are doing it just now as a bit of a craze to push forward and get the maximum. It's not helping. And this is the thing, like my, the reason I do this is to help guys. I get guys real results. I have hundreds and hundreds of video testimonials. I give advice to guys. I help guys. I can sit there and do reaction videos. I can slaughter some. I mean, I can really slaughter some of the advice out there if I want to. And I can make it very entertaining and very funny. And I don't because I think it's, it's going to get me views, but it's not going to help. Men, men are not going to look at it and go, thank you, Kezia. Now I know how to talk to women. I want men It's not to solutions. And, yeah, exactly. I want guys to look at my videos and go, okay, how do I practically implement that? Why do women do this? Okay, I've got it. What do I say next? That's how I want to help men. It's practical advice. And I just think a lot of this is just, it's giving guys another reason to sit at home, be entertained uh, with, with, you know, a drama. And it's, it's so contrived it's so contrived like some of them are actually even working together you know you do this of me you do a reaction video of me and i'll do a reaction video of you it will look like we're enemies and they just take you know they're just making money out of ads so guys out there you know when you're looking at this stuff think about what am i getting from this am i getting advice that i can apply and that can really help me in life or am i just being distracted and watching a bunch of 32 year old guys arguing with each other you know on a on a podcast or or a youtube channel yeah it's designed to be sensational not to give value whereas i think as you said like you would want to try and lead with solutions and value to help people moving forward and if that gets 10 percent of the 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 engagement then the views that somebody else gets unfortunately that's just the way the platform is at the moment but people can vote with their feet and they can choose to tune into not the right things, but the more valuable things for them that they're going to get returned for. Like, yes, it's important to be entertained. And during this conversation, we've tried to be valuable, but of course share entertaining insights as well. But some people are just optimizing purely, op- exactly balanced. They're optimizing purely for the fast-paced, bang, like exciting fast-paced content that has very low level value but high levels of stimulus and that's the way the space is going but people can choose what they're watching and if like if the audience continues to tune in then those videos are going to continue to be created it's a free market um okay thank you for coming onto my youtube channel and doing this how can people find out more about you where can they go Thanks for having me, Kezia. Real pleasure. Really enjoyed the chat and uh, fun as always. Uh, best place to find me is Instagram and that's at call.cambro, which is C-O-L dot C-A-M-B-R-O. And if you're into podcasts, you can find me on wherever you get your podcasts and it's Cambro Conversations. Kezia has been on there, which was a fantastic conversation, but there's another 140 other episodes that you can dive into as well. Okay, I'll provide all those links. If you're listening to this, if you're watching this, I should say on YouTube, the links will be below this video. Okay, thanks again and have a wonderful day. Take care.